Hey everyone, Steve from Backcountry Gallery here, and this time around, I want to share my menu setup for autofocus for the Z8 and the Z9. Now, in this video, we're going to take a look at the custom setting menu. We're going to look at the focus section of that menu, and we're going to cover all 15 items. I'm going to tell you what they do, and whether you need them or not, or whether I think you need them or not. And then we're going to look at my button setup, too, under the controls menu. So we have a lot of stuff to cover in this video. However, before we get too far, I do want to emphasize that just because I'm doing something a certain way or another photographer is doing something a certain way, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's right for you. The reason we have so many options and so many different things that we can set to different buttons and ways that we can set our menus is because we're all wired differently. So as you're watching this video, I encourage you to kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And if you see something that doesn't seem like it's going to work for you, don't follow the advice. If you see something that you think is going to be great, then go ahead and follow it. But pick the stuff that you think is going to work best for you. And finally, before we jump in, I do want to mention that my Z8 and Z9 wildlife setup guide is available now. And what we're covering in this video is just a small portion of what's actually in that book. In fact, the book is going to cover the stuff that we're talking about in this video in more detail than what we're going to be able to do in the time that we have here together. So definitely take a look at it. Plus the, that book covers like everything else too. So we have not just autofocus, but we have all the other menu settings that I use for wildlife photography are in that book too, as well as how to use the different AF areas and subject detection and all that good stuff. So I hope you'll check that out. For now though, let's dive in and let me show you how I have this configured. Okay, so we're gonna start our journey here in the focus menu on the custom setting menu. So you're gonna to wanna to go there and just press focus. And we're gonna have about 15 different items to look at here. So this is gonna take a minute or two to get through it, but I'll try to be as brief as possible. So the first one is AFC priority selection. And if we give that a click and go in there, we can see we have three options. I recommend setting to release instead of focus and release or focus. Now, focus plus release, what it's supposed to do is it's supposed to try to get a confirmed AF lock before it starts shooting. I've played with this and I can certainly get it to shoot before that happens, so I don't see a lot of use for that particular feature here. It might help sometimes, but for the most part, I haven't seen much benefit. The other one, though, is focus, and basically what the idea behind this is, is the camera won't fire unless it has a confirmed AF lock. And at first that sounds great because, you know, we don't want autofocus pictures, right? But the problem is that sometimes the camera has actually achieved focus or our subject is very, very sharp. It's absolutely fine, but the camera has not confirmed the lock. In those cases, the camera's not going to fire until it does confirm the lock and it can cost missed shots. So I leave this set at release so that I get all of those sharp but not confirmed shots too. It does mean I have a few more to delete later on, but I'd rather have that than to miss those opportunities. In addition, focus doesn't guarantee anything anyway. If you're doing like a bird in flight and it's flying past you and focus is on the wing, maybe the camera has a confirmed focus lock, but that doesn't mean the focus is where you wanted it anyway. So it's not foolproof either way. I highly recommend putting this on release and leaving it there. Every shot that you've ever seen from me for wildlife, has been shot on release mode. I'm in AFC and I'm using release for my AFC priority selection. So let's move on. Next we have AFS priority selection. I don't use AFS as a wildlife shooter. The way AFS works is when you focus on your target, it's gonna lock in that focus distance and once it achieves focus, it's not gonna change that distance. This is great for a focus and recompose scenario. However, with wildlife, Sometimes you're moving, especially if you're hand holding, and sometimes the animal is moving a little bit. And we wanna make sure that we keep autofocus engaged and preferably right on the eye. And AFC will make sure that it keeps adjusting focus as we move or as the animal moves, whereas AFS will not. So I don't worry about this one at all because frankly, it's not something I'm ever gonna use. In fact, I'm gonna turn it off here in just a little bit and I'll show you how to do that. Next, we have focus tracking with lock on. And if you go into this menu, it's a little bit intimidating. So we're gonna go over this kind of step by step. I'm gonna give you the quickest explanation I can for this. And I just wanna emphasize that my setup guide goes into much more detail than we have time for here in the video. But basically, this is broken up into two categories. The first is the block shot AF response. And I think a better name for this would be, what does the camera do when it senses a drastic change in distance under our AF point. So the idea with this is that if, for example, we're photographing a bird in flight and the bird's flying past and it goes behind a tree, 
when the autofocus sensor has that tree under it, it's going to see a drastic change in distance. So it says, okay, how long should I wait before I focus on that tree and let go of the distance that I was at for the bird? And that's what this adjusts. If you set it at five, it'll wait a long time. If you set it at one, it'll probably focus on the tree. So you have to decide where you want this to be in here. Now, the other thing that I use this for, and I think that probably is more appropriate for wildlife photographers, is it's, you can think of it as the, hey, I slipped off my target as I was panning. How long should the camera wait before it focuses on the background? And again, this works the same way. If you want it to wait a long time, you set on the delayed side, more over here towards five. However, if you want it to not do that and just focus on the background right away, you go over towards one. So at this point, you're probably like, well, it sounds like we should be on delayed all the time, but that's not the case either though, because sometimes we do want the camera to quickly change focus if it senses that distance. And there's a couple of scenarios that come to mind. The first is if you're trying to catch onto a bird and the camera accidentally locks onto the background. In that case, you want to be able to put your autofocus point over the bird and have the camera very quickly jump to the bird and not get stuck on the background. If you're set to delayed and it's stuck on that background, it's going to be very hesitant to go back on that bird. It's going to take it longer. It's None of this is really long per se, although when you're shooting, it feels that way. So in those cases, sometimes quick, like one or two is a little bit better. The other scenario that comes up is if you're rapidly going from one subject to another, and you're focusing on maybe, a, you know, there's a bunch of birds and you're jumping from one to the other. If this is set quick, you can just leave your finger on the AF on button or have pressed on the shutter release, depending on how you fly. And you can go from one target to another and it'll quickly jump from one to the other and it won't have that delay in there. So for most people, I recommend starting right here in the middle at three so that you kind of have the compromise setting there. You know, it's not too fast, not too slow. But if the autofocus system seems too sticky, you're gonna to wanna to go down towards the quick side so that it releases the target and goes to a new target faster. On the other hand, if it seems like it's slipping off your target all the time, you wanna be at four or five. And again, I like to tell people, and you'll read this in my book, this is not a set it and forget it setting. You have to kind of judge each scenario separately. And if you're finding the cameras too sticky or too loose, you can come in here and make it so it's more sticky or less sticky by going to quick or delayed. Next we have subject motion, and we have steady or erratic. For the most part, I leave this on steady, but sometimes I'll go to erratic, it depends on the scenario, like maybe for bird bursting into flight, stuff like that. And subject motion is a little bit confusing here sometimes. Subject motion actually refers to sudden starts and stops, not so much if the bird is, or the animal is like zigzagging all over the place. That's not really what we're looking at here. This is more for sudden, starts and stops. Nikon is the best example. They say like a pole vaulter, they come up and they're moving very fast and then they come to a quick stop. That's what this setting is for. So if you have a bird that's gonna burst into flight or maybe come in for a hard landing, maybe erratic's a little bit better. For most regular mammals and wildlife subjects, I am gonna leave this on steady and most birds it's on steady too. However, you know, you could always come in here if you're in one of those specific scenarios. And again, I do want to emphasize this was a very, very, very brief <laughs> explanation. There's a little bit more to it than that. And I give more explanation in the setup guide. But for now, I think this is enough to get us started. Next, we have focus points used. And if we look under this menu, we see that we have two different options, one for all points and another for alternating points. And the biggest point of confusion with this setting is that people think it's somehow affecting their AF areas. So the camera can only use alternating points or it gets to use all the points. Just to be 100% clear, the camera can always use all the points. What this does is it determines what happens when you move from point to point to point with your joystick or multi-selector. Is the camera going to stop at every single AF point, every single designated AF spot on the sensor? Or is it going to skip every other one and go a little bit faster? So this is basically a convenience for you as you're moving your AF area, your AF points around the viewfinder. If you find that it seems like it just takes forever to get across because it's like one little tiny move at a time, then you'll want to try alternating points. If it doesn't bother you, you can do like I do and just leave it at all points. And then you have a little more granularity when you're trying to really pinpoint autofocus when you're trying to move like a single AF point into position. So hopefully that helps. Next, we have store points by orientation. We're gonna jump into that menu. Right now, I have it off. Don't read anything into that. I use this sometimes, sometimes I don't. But 
Anyhow, we have two options here you might be interested in. The first is focus point, and the other is focus point in AF area mode. So let me explain what this does with focus point, and then the focus point in AF area mode will make even more sense. So basically the way this works is the camera is going to remember where your AF point was in the viewfinder, it's positioned in the viewfinder, the last time you were in horizontal orientation and the last time you were in vertical orientation. So for example, if I have my AF point right in the center of the frame when I'm shooting horizontally, and then I flip it to vertical and I move that AF point up to the top in my vertical orientation, up towards the top, and now if I flip it back to horizontal, it's going to go right back to the middle. And if I flip it to vertical, it'll go back up to the top. Anytime I move it in the orientation, it's going to reset the position and remember that position for me. So that's kind of handy. I'm going to give you an example here in a moment. Now, we also have focus point and AF area. And you can probably guess what this is going to do. Not only is it going to remember the position of your focus point, it's also going to remember which AF area you were using in vertical or horizontal mode. So let me give you an example of how maybe this one right here would work. So let's put you into a scenario where you're doing some bird photography and you have birds that are flying and you have some birds that are posing and you want to shoot verticals of those birds. So that's the scenario. So for the flyers, let's say you're basically centered up in the viewfinder with a wide large area. However, for the vertical shots, you want to tip the camera vertically and you want to use just a small like single AF point up towards the top where their heads are. So in this case, what the camera is going to do, it's going to remember all of that for you. So in practice, the way this is going to work is if you see birds coming in and you flip the camera horizontally to get those flight shots, what it's going to do is it's going to take your large AF area mode, it's going to stick it in the center, just like you had the last time you were in that orientation, and you're going to be able to fire away. Let's say the birds are gone and you want to go back to your vertical shots. When you flip the camera vertical, it's going to say, hey, last time they were using vertical, they wanted single point AF right at the top. So it's going to do that for you. And it's going to flip back and forth as you go from horizontal to vertical. And it's going to remember all of those positions in AF area modes. To change them, all you have to do is while you're in that orientation, either move it or change the AF area mode, and that's going to be the new thing. So you don't have to really set anything. It'll remember as it goes. Again, it's going to remember how things were the last time you were in that mode. So the only caveat here is that sometimes people will set this, they'll turn it on, and then I always get an email from people they'll, and they'll say, hey, I have my camera, every time I flip it vertical, the AF point changes and jumps to a new location. When I flip it back, it goes back to the way it was. The reason is because they have this turned on. So sometimes this is really handy, sometimes it's not. So this is one of those maybe not set it and forget it type of thing. So maybe you want to come in here and use it as needed and just keep it off when you don't. Next we have AF activation. And this is how we activate back button AF. If you want to use shutter AF, which is perfectly fine, just select the top one where it says shutter slash AF on. For me, I want to use AF on only, and I don't want my shutter release to do any focusing. And there's kind of a little extra menu here. If you press the right side of the multi-selector, you're going to want to make sure that out of focus release is enabled here as well. So that shouldn't be a problem in AFC anyhow, but I always come in here and just make sure it's enabled. Next we have focus point persistence and I recommend leaving this set to auto. Basically what this is going to do is it's going to tell the camera that if the camera is in charge of the AF area and you override it, that you want to pick up where the camera left off. So let me give you kind of an example of how that would work. So let's say you're in the auto AF area and maybe you're using subject detection or maybe just using it normally, it doesn't really matter. And the camera is focused on your subject. And then let's say you have a button set to go to single point AF, maybe FN1, and you press FN1. With focus point persistence enabled, that AF point will go exactly where the camera left off. So the last thing the camera is focusing on is what the AF point is going is where your AF point is going to land, if that makes sense. The flip side of that though is that if you have this off, what's going to happen? is that the AF point's gonna to go to wherever it was the last time you were using it. So if you had it like in the center of the frame, for instance, but your auto AF area was maybe on something that was not in the center of the frame, then 
when you press your override, it's not going to go to where the auto AF area is working. Instead, it'll focus in the center, which may or may not be what you want. So this makes it so that if the camera is currently in charge of where the AF point is, and that's going to happen if the camera is in auto AF or 3D AF, or if subject detection is active and working in auto 3D or wide AF. Okay, so what that means is that if you press your override button and this is on, it's going to go exactly where the camera was focusing last. So I honestly don't see any good reason to ever shut this off. I leave it on all the time. I've never had an occasion where I was like, oh, this is not working, I don't want this. So my recommendation, just leave this on auto and don't worry about it, but that's, that's kind of what it does. And again, I have some more information about this in the book if you wanna see some more examples of how this works. Next, we have Limit AF Area Mode Selection. Now, if we go into this menu, we see a bunch of different AF Area Modes, and in my case, some are checked and some aren't. Basically, when we are manually selecting our AF Area Modes, I'm not talking about button overrides here. Basically, when you're pressing that Focus Mode button on the side of the camera and holding it in and using your command dials to go through and pick which AF Area you want, this allows us to shut some of those options off, some of the ones that we don't use. So for example, I pinpoint off because I don't really use it, but and honestly it's an AFS thing, so I wouldn't use it anyway, so it doesn't really matter if it's on or off. Uh, single point AF is mandatory, but if you notice, I have a couple of the dynamic AF areas off, medium and large, because I simply don't use them. Everything else I believe is pretty much turned on with this camera, but I, since I don't use dynamic medium or large, I don't see any point of having to scroll past them every time I'm trying to find an AF area. There's enough of them as it is. And in fact, as time goes on, I might even whittle this down somehow a little bit more. I don't know, I use a lot of this stuff in here though. One thing with the Nikon Z8 and Z9, they are sensitive to using the right AF area. I think sometimes a lot of the complaints that we hear about them as far as AF not being great is simply because you really need to pick the correct AF area for whatever you're facing in your viewfinder. And again, that's something that we're not gonna be able to talk about in this particular video, but it is something that is covered very thoroughly in my Z9 and Z8 setup guide there. So if you wanna take a look at that, if you have any questions, but anyhow, I turn these two off, but if there's anything in here that you don't use, you can come in here and turn it off and then you won't have to scroll through it when you're trying to pick your AF area. Head back out to the menu here. Next, we have focus mode restrictions. And you'll see we have multiple options here. Now, focus mode is not AF area. This is your focus mode. This is AFC, AFS, manual focus, that type of thing. It has nothing to do really with your AF areas, okay? Just to be clear on that. I have mine set for continuous AF, and what this does is it locks me into continuous AF. I can't select single AF or even manual focus if I want to when I press my focus mode button on the side of the camera. If I press that in and spin the rear command dial, I'm not gonna go anywhere. It's not going to change to single AF, continuous AF, or manual focus. It's not gonna scroll between those. Instead, I'm just gonna be kind of locked into continuous AF, which as a back button AF shooter, that's exactly what I want. I wanna be in continuous AF. I don't wanna accidentally go into single AF or manual focus. And it's very easy to do that if you're trying to switch AF areas. Maybe you're in wide large and you wanna to go to single point. If you accidentally go to single AF, a lot of times single point AF is actually the AF area mode that's there. And if you're not paying attention, it's very easy to think you're in single point AF and continuous AF when you're really in single point AF, single AF. So the camera's no longer follow focusing your subject like you think it's supposed to be and you're getting all these out of focus photos. And you're like, what's going on? So my advice, especially if you're a back button AF shooter is to come in here and select continuous AF. Now, if you're a shutter release shooter and you're actually using single AF and continuous AF back and forth, then you know you can just go ahead and leave it at no restrictions, that's fine. Now one concern I've had people bring up is that in this case, it looks like you can't get into manual focus, but you absolutely can. Your lenses generally have a manual focus override switch on them, or you could grab the focus ring and just start focusing, so that's not been a problem at all. So this is how I have mine set, but again, use with care, it depends if you're shutter release, focusing or back button AF focusing. For back button AF, I do recommend this. Next, we have focus point wraparound, and that's just a toggle and on and off switch. I leave mine off simply because as I get to the edge of the viewfinder, if I push one too far, I'm gonna wonder what happened to my AF button because I'm wildly uncoordinated, so I just leave this off. So when I get to the edge, it stops and I can bring it back to each their own on this. Next, we have focus point display. 
And if we jump into this menu, you'll see we have four different options here. The first is manual focus mode. I leave that on. Basically what that does is it makes sure that the AF area remains in the viewfinder when you're manually focusing. And I find that handy because you can put that AF area over whatever it is you're trying to focus on. And as you focus, you'll get that little range finder that has the two arrows and the dot to confirm focus. Now on the other hand, if this is off, the camera is still going to read focus from wherever the focus point was prior to going into manual focus mode. However, I find that a little more difficult since I can't see that focus point visually in the viewfinder anymore. Next we have dynamic area AF assist. If you shut this off, you lose the little dots around the dynamic AF area. So if you're like in dynamic small, you see the little square in the middle, the AF point in the middle, the primary AF point, and then around it, it's surrounded by those dots. If you turn this off, the dots are gone. You don't know where your boundaries are. So again, I would leave this on. This one is not on by default AFC in focus display. What this does, I highly recommend turning this on. What this does is by default, the Z9 and the Z8, when you're in AFC mode, are not going to turn the AF area green when they have a confirmed lock. If you turn this on, it'll turn your AF area green in AFC mode when you have that confirmed lock. So I highly recommend turning that on. And then we have the 3D focus point color. You can turn that from red to white if you prefer. I just leave it at red. I think it's fine as a red focus point, but some people like it white and you can do it that way too. Whatever, you, whatever floats your boat there. Next, we have the built-in AF Assist Illuminator, and I just have that shut off. I'm in AFC mode, so that shouldn't come on anyway, but I have it shut off. Next, we have Focus Peaking, and I think that needs a little bit of an explanation. Basically, when you're in manual focus mode and you have this turned on, what it's gonna do is paint the contrasty areas of your subject as you're trying to focus, and the sharper the image gets, the more of that paint you'll see on the subject. So it's a nice way to manually focus and kind of get a little extra feedback as to whether or not you're sharp or not. So I like to have this on. There's another reason too, we'll talk about in just a second too, but I usually leave this on. So our options are pretty simple. First we have on and off if we want it on or off. Next we have sensitivity and we have a choice between one, two, and three. Most of the time I have this set at three. And again, I have a special reason why. Just a moment, we'll get to it. But if you find there's too much paint as you're manually focusing, you can go down to two or even one. Every subject is going to be different. The more contrasty the subject, the lower the uh, sensitivity that you'll want to use. And the less contrast you have, you'll probably need higher sensitivity in order to see enough of the little paint for it to be meaningful. And finally, we can choose the color. We have red and white and yellow and blue and all these great colors here. So, and this is one you may have to come in here and change from time to time. In fact, I put this on my eye menu just so it's quick to get to because if I'm shooting, say, a red flower and I happen to have my focus peaking color is red, makes it kind of hard to see. So maybe I want white or you know yellow or blue or something like that. So anyhow, let's go back here. And one of the things I do want to talk about here is another reason that I use this and that is because I have my manual focus override switch turned on uh, at A15 on this menu. You'll see that here in just a bit. But basically, if I have that turned on and I bump my manual focus ring when I don't intend to, I'm going to suddenly start seeing peaking show up. So it's an indication that I've accidentally entered manual focus override mode and that I'm not actually autofocusing anymore. So it's kind of a good reminder like, oh, I got to let go of that or, you know, pump my autofocus again to get it back re-engaged. So I like having peaking turned on just as kind of an early warning system for those times that maybe I accidentally bump my manual focus ring and go into manual focus override mode. Man, we are getting down there, aren't we? Next we have focus point selection speed. And if we go in here, we see that we have low, normal, and high. Low is really painfully slow. Normal is pretty good, and probably for most people that's not too bad. I have mine set to high, though, because I am not doing that alternating point thing we talked about earlier in the video, and this lets the AF point really zip around the viewfinder. But sometimes when you're really trying to fine-tune it, it can be a little bit tough to get it just where you want it because it's moving kind of fast. It's very sensitive. But either way, I find that high overall has worked better for me. But, you know, obviously pick what seems to work well for you from this menu. But again, try high, see if you like it. It takes uh, maybe a week or so of using it before you really get used to it. Just heads up. 
Finally, we have manual focus ring in AF mode. I do turn this on. You're not gonna see this necessarily for every lens. If you have a lens that's not compatible with this feature attached to your camera, like an F mount lens, this A15 isn't gonna show up and you're gonna stop at A14 and go, what is, what is he talking about? So this menu doesn't always show up. But I do have a compatible lens on the camera right now. It's the 404.5 is what happens to be on there at the moment. And this does allow me to use the manual focus ring in AF mode. And I do leave this turned on because there's a lot of times I want to grab that manual focus ring and override focus right on the spot because maybe the camera focus too far is too close. It's stuck on something. Sometimes the best way to fix a bad AF lock is to grab that focus ring and do it yourself. So I definitely want this turned on. If you turn this off and you grab your manual focus ring, guess what? nothing happens so i leave this on and like i say i use focus peaking so i kind of know if i accidentally bump that ring because sometimes when you're holding the lens you, you, your wrist kind of rubs up against it and pushes it a little bit enough all of a sudden i see whatever focus peaking color is active at the time red in this case then i'll oh i went into that so then i'll release autofocus on press it again and re-engage so i do leave this one on though so that wraps it up for this part of the menu. Now let's take a look at how I have my buttons configured for autofocus on the Z8 and Z9. So let's go down to the controls menu and we're going to jump in here to custom controls shooting and one more click over to the right and I'm going to show you how I have my button set up for my autofocus functions. And we're going to go a little out of order here just because it'll make a little bit more sense to do it that way. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually set my video record button. So let me find where that is. Here we go. And what I do with this button is I have it set to change my AF mode and my AF area. Now, again, my AF mode is locked into AFC, so it's not going to change anything there. But I do like having this set to the focus mode, AF area mode option, so that rather than trying to reach around, for some reason, that little focus mode button on the bottom left side of the camera down there by the lens mount is kind of a pain to work with. And I find this is especially true if you're hand holding a long lens and trying to change your AF area mode while looking through the viewfinder, which is usually how I do it. It's pretty much impossible to use that button unless you have a third hand somewhere. And I've found that it's much, much easier for me just to kind of slide my finger over to that video record button when I want to change my AF area. Because one of the things we're going to talk about is that I think the autofocus button overrides are nice on Nikon, but I think people kind of use them a little bit too much. And I prefer to just be in the AF area that I think I'm going to need for the scene and use overrides as just that, as an override. So for me, I want faster access to change my AF area modes. And by putting it on the video record button, I just give it a press and I spin the dial. And next thing you know, I'm jumping from one AF area mode to the other. I love it. So I highly recommend that one for sure. So going back up towards the top here, let's talk about the buttons I do program. And again, I want to emphasize that I think sometimes people get a little carried away with these overrides. They have every button they can program for them, program for something. One does 3D, one does single point, one does wide large, one does auto, one does wide small, then one does a custom wide. To me, that's a little bit overboard because at least for my way of shooting, I don't want to have to try to remember where all my buttons are and what each button does in the heat of the moment. I want to have a couple quick overrides I can use and I want to try to be in the correct AF mode to begin with. That's why I put my AF mode selector right on that video record button. However, I do have a couple buttons that I do program, so let's talk about what those are and why I program them the way I do. So the first is FN1 on the Z8 and FN1 and FN3 on the Z9, and those are all programmed for 3D. In order to do that, we just highlight the button we want to select here, FN1 in this case. We give that a click, and we select AF Area Mode, and then we go one more over, and we select 3D Tracking. Now there is an alternative here. With this setup, I still have to initiate AF with my AF on button. So I have to press the override button plus my AF on button, or if I'm using shutter release, I have to half press the shutter release and keep that uh, function one button engaged as well. Some people don't mind that. I think it's the easiest way to go, but other people want the button to focus when they go to the override. I've found that a little problematic. Sometimes I want to override, but I'm not quite ready to focus exactly where 
the a point is I want to move the camera a little bit, I want to reposition a little bit, and I'm kind of in override mode, so I'm just swinging around to get right to the spot that I want. In the meantime, the camera's focusing during the override. I don't really like it doing that. It's a minor problem, I, I realize, but I find it easier to keep my autofocus and my overrides separate. But if you do want to have it focus, and a lot of people do, you just go to the AF area mode plus AF on and select 3D from that menu. So the big question here though is why do I have FN1 and FN1 and FN3 on the Z9 programmed for 3D? So first let's address the Z9 because I have two buttons programmed for 3D and that's sometimes people are like, why are you doing that? The thing is when I'm using the Z9 horizontally, my middle finger comes right down on that FN1 button. So that's great. When I do it vertically, guess where my middle finger comes down? On the FN3 button. So I have them both set for 3D so that when I want that override, I don't have to try to remember whether I'm vertical or horizontal or anything else. It's just boom, put middle finger down, it'll be on the right button and you got it. So that's why I have them both set the same. And I do that a lot on the Z9. I have my vertical controls and my horizontal controls set the same way so that I have some ergonomic consistency there. So why 3D though? Why does 3D get these primo spots on my buttons, right? On my overrides? Well, the reason is simple. I think one of the biggest benefits with mirrorless cameras is the fact that you can put tracking modes in there like 3D on our Z8 and our Z9. You have these tracking modes. that can go all over the viewfinder and follow a subject's face or eye or whatever, and that's fantastic. It gives you so much compositional freedom to kind of create the composition you want. So a lot of times, maybe I'll start with like something like wide small or something, and I get on the subject real quick with that. I like the wide areas for getting on a subject fast, but then I see subject detection take over, and I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna override that, so I'll press my FN1 button down, and then I can move the camera around, and I can go anywhere I want, put the subject anywhere I want, and it'll stick right on the eye there. So that's super, super handy, and it just it's a lot of compositional freedom. I also like this handoff method for tougher moving targets. So sometimes if I have an animal that's in motion, a bird flying, a mammal running, whatever, it's easier to get on that target with the wide AF areas, the larger AF areas, than it is to get on that target with something like the little slightly larger than single point 3D AF area. It's very small. So sometimes it's a little bit easier to get on target with those larger AF areas. So I get on the target with the wide AF area once the camera locks on and focuses, and once I see that subject detection says, yeah, I see the face or the eye or whatever, then I'll go ahead and press in FN1, or if I'm vertical, FN3, so 3D will take over, and now I have run of the frame. The animal, if I'm having a hard time keeping the animal in the frame, it doesn't matter if it goes a little too far one way or the other. The if area is going to stay or try to stay with that animal. So that's very helpful. But on the other hand, you know, if the animal isn't going too fast, and I want to maybe push it a little further, you know, forward or a little farther backward in the frame as I'm panning, I can do that. And I don't have to constantly worry about where my wide AF area is or try to move that while I'm shooting those moving targets. So it's very freeing from that standpoint. So I use this a lot and I highly recommend 3D AF on FN1. And that was a super brief explanation there. I go over this in a lot more detail in the setup guide if you want to take a look at that. Next we have FN2 and this is set for wide C1 and the way I do that is we just give that a click and once again it's the same thing we go to AF area mode and then we select wide area AF C1 in my case. Now what I've done with my C1 AF area is I have made it into a one by one AF area and what that does is it basically simulates single point AF, but there's an important difference because people are like, why would you do that? You already have single point, right? But there's an important difference. The one by one wide AF area still supports subject detection. Single point AF does not support subject detection, but the wide areas do. So basically, I'm using a single AF point. I have all the benefits of single point AF with subject detection. And the nice thing about it is that if you are working with a subject where the camera detects what that subject is, it sees its face, eye, whatever, if you're in that situation, you can kind of get the single AF point in the ballpark. So it's on the face, it's not wandering around, it's not going to little holes in trees or something on the, on the fur or something. You can get on the face and 
it'll kind of just jump to the eye and you don't have to stay on the eye. With normal single point AF, if you're trying this, you have to keep the AF point on the eye the entire time. With this, you can be a little more sloppy and you're still gonna get a nice sharp photo. The subject detection system is still gonna stick to the eye. Now, if you get too far from the eye, obviously it's going to not stay on the face or the eye anymore if you get down the body too far. So there is a limit to how far away you can go with this setup but it does give you kind of the precision of single point. You can say, look, I want you to focus on the uh, on the eye and it's in this direct area here. So the camera's not accidentally wandering off to, like I say, a, a knot in a tree or something like that. I've had that happen with the larger areas. Now, the other benefit here is that I have my display button, the DISP button set to recall shooting functions. And the only thing I have it set to do in recall shooting functions is to shut off subject detection. So if I'm in a situation where I have an animal where subject detection isn't working very well, but I want to be right on that eye and I want to use single point, all I have to do is tap that DISP button and I'm in basically single point IF with that wide one by one area. So I have basically single point and single point with subject detection all at a very quick push of the button. It works really, really well. And again, I have a, an extended, maybe even better explanation in the guide for you there, but I highly recommend giving it a try. It's, it's, it's worked out really well for me. I've been very, very happy with it. Next, moving down, we have the AF on button. And since I'm using back button AF, I have this set to AF on. Now, if you're using shutter release AF, you might want to consider this for something like an override for 3D. I think 3D would be great back here if I was using shutter release AF. So that's just you know something to consider. But for me, I have that set to AF on. Now, if you're a Z8 user with a grip or a Z9 user, I recommend duplicating the AF on button function by going down here and making sure that this is set to AF on button for vertical shooting is the same as AF on button. That's the default, so if you haven't changed it, it should be fine. Now, if you are a shutter release shooter, I would again leave this same as AF on button so you have consistency. So if you have your AF on button set again for like 3D AF as an override, if you leave this same as AF on button, when you go vertical, you're gonna have 3D AF on the vertical AF on button. So that's how I recommend setting. Just make sure that you, you leave that alone. You might want to double check it just to make sure it wasn't changed. Next, let's talk about that display button. And I'm using recall shooting functions, the hold option. And basically that means that when I tap it, the camera is going to hold those settings until I either tap it again, you shut the camera off, or you do something like adjust exposure compensation for some reason that shuts it off or ISO or something like that. Any of those things shut it off, but it will, you don't have to keep pressing the button is the point. So let's say I take a look at how I have that set up. And again, this is set up to basically just shut off subject detection. And it's a shame because I really wish Nikon would allow us multiple recall shooting functions because I have a few other functions I could do with this. But for me, there's so many times subject detection isn't working or it's on the wrong thing and it's getting stuck and it's, you know, it's basically working against me rather than for me. And I want a quick way to shut it off. I don't want to jump into the eye menu and try to shut it off. I don't want to go into the photo shooting menu to shut it off. So for me, having a button where I could just tap it and shut that off works really well. So let's take a look at how to set this up. It's actually pretty simple. We just go into the sub menu here and we make sure all of these are unchecked. So right now that's checked. Just press the OK button to uncheck. And I'm going to uncheck all of these, and I'm just going to go down to where it says AF subject detection options. And I'm going to make sure that's checked. And I have mine set to off, so when I press the display button, it's going to shut it off. And in this case, we do have some options under this particular menu item. If you notice below it there, it says set in that little square, I'll highlight it there for you. And if I click the right hand side of the multi selector, I'll see my options for AF subject detection options. So I could use this override to turn it on, for example, for people or animals or vehicles or auto or whatever. So for the most part, I like it on more than I like it off. So I have the default set to, I have it on all the time. And then I use this option here. I press the display button when I want to shut it off. And that's all you have to do when you're done, press the menu button to lock it all in. Also, because I do change my viewfinder and LCD displays, there's multiple things you can set up. Again, that's covered very thoroughly in the Z9 and Z8 setup guide, but I had to put my display switch someplace else. So I ended up putting it on the joysticks, as you can see down here. And once again, if you're using a Z9 or a Z8 with a grip, I would make sure they are both set the same. And that allows me to change the 
display layout on the in the viewfinder and on the back LCD. If you don't use that, you can use your joystick for something else. Now I have a lot of people ask me, why not put recall shooting functions on there and shut subject detection off with your joystick? And the reason for that is simple. The joystick press is a little bit tough to do sometimes. If you're in a hurry, you're a little bit sloppy, instead of pressing it on the joystick, you end up moving your AF area. And there is a menu option that makes sub selector pressing easier, but even with that enabled, it's not as easy as it is just to press the display button. So if I'm in a situation where I'm trying to shut subject detection off, it's probably a little more frantic and I don't want my AF point to move if I'm shutting subject detection off. So I put it on the joystick instead. I put display on the joystick instead rather than putting recall shooting functions there. Now the next option we have here is preset focus position. That is the OK button. And I'm going to show you how that one works. Normally, this is set to something called reset, which basically means if you press OK, it'll recenter your AF point. The cool thing about preset focus point is it can do that, but it can do more. So if we go in here, the top option is preset focus point, and we have a couple of sub options here. Right now, I just have the camera set to press to recall focus point. And basically what it's going to do is when I press the OK button, it'll go back to the position where I want the focus point wherever I program it. And I'm going to show you how to do that in just a second. But we have another option here, which is kind of interesting, and it's hold to recall focus point. Now, to me, this doesn't work so great on the OK button because it's kind of hard to work with. But, but basically what this allows you to do is sort of have two AF positions simultaneously and jump back and forth between them. So let's say you have your preset focus point off to the right and you have your AF area at the moment right in the middle. OK, so if you press your OK button, if this is set like this, if you press your OK button, it will jump to the right hand side. But when you release it, it's going to jump back to the middle. So it kind of lets you have the AF point in two positions at once. However, I don't think the OK button is a great place for that because it's in kind of an awkward place to get to. So you might want to do preset focus point on a different button if that's appealing to you. So if you're using it with the OK button, which is what I'm doing, I use press to recall focus point. But here's the cool thing. I can program the camera to have that AF point wherever I want it in the viewfinder, not just in the center. So once you have this set, all you have to do is position your AF point wherever you want it in the viewfinder, and then you press the focus mode button or the button that you program for focus mode. You could, in this case, we did the video record button. You can press that. You press and hold that while pressing and holding the OK button, and that will lock in the position of your focus point. It'll flash at you to indicate that it's locked in. Now you can move it wherever you want, and when you press it again, it'll jump there. Now most of the time, I have this set just to the center, so it's working like the reset, so if I want to recenter it real quick. But if I'm in a situation where I want that focus point to jump somewhere else, when I press the OK button, I can do that too with this option, so that's pretty cool. So finally, let me show you one last autofocus thing that I've done here, setup thing that I've done with my Z8 and Z9, and that is the save focus position and recall focus position options. So basically what this is going to do, the way I have this set is my lens function button is going to save my current focus position. And if I press lens function two, the lens is going to go back to that position. And I'm going to give you examples of why that's important in just a moment, because for wildlife photography, it seems maybe this isn't too critical because after all, how often is our wildlife subject going to be exactly at the same distance, which is like the answer I think is never. So, but there are ways you can use this. So let's take a look at the setup first. So let's start with saving our focus position. So you have to have basically two buttons involved here. And for me, I use the lens function buttons on this, but you can also use other buttons. I think just about every programmable button supports this. Not everyone, but most of them do. So in our example, we'll use the lens function buttons. And it's just basically right here. It's under the press category. It's right up towards the top. It's safe focus position. And there are a couple options. It is safe to all or safe individually. So for most wildlife photography work, I think save to all is all you need. You're not going to probably use this with multiple distances, but you can. So the way it would work is save to all is the one I recommend. That's going to save any button you have set to recall focus position is going to go to whatever position you save with this button. However, if you select save individually and you have multiple buttons set for recall focus position, like you have maybe the lens function button and maybe FN2 or something, those are both saved, those are both set to recall focus position. What's going to happen when you long press this lens function button 
is after a second or so, in the viewfinder, you're gonna see a yellow focus icon flashing at you. And that's your cue to go ahead and press one of the recall focus position buttons that you have previously programmed. I'm gonna show you how to do that in just a moment. So, for example, I have my Lens Function 2 button ready to go, so I can press that and it'll save it to my Lens Function 2 button. And all I have to do to recall that distance is press Lens Function 2 and the focus distance will zip right to it. So that's pretty cool. And you can save this to as many buttons as you want to program for recall focus position. However, I think for wildlife photographers, usually one is enough. Very seldom do we need two or more. Anyhow, since we're only using one button, save to all is what we want. Then we have lens function two, and that's going to recall our focus position. And that's a little bit simpler. It's just recall focus position. There's no submenu here. Just make sure it's set to that. Now actually using this in the field with safe focus position set to save to all is actually pretty easy. So the way this is gonna work is you're just gonna long press that lens FN button and this time you're gonna see a white focus icon flashing in the viewfinder. As soon as you see it, you're done. Just release the button and the focus position is saved and any button that you have set for recall focus position, in this case the lens FN2 button, is gonna recall the focus distance you just saved. Very, very simple. So the question is, why would you want to do this? How does this work, right? So the way I use this in the field is usually one of two things. The first is maybe I'm on a nest or I'm on a den or something like that. I'm in a spot where the animal is frequenting, maybe some kind of a feeder or some kind of a kill or something like that. And there's other stuff going on. So maybe I'm photographing some lions at a kill and they're over there grooming or something. I'm photographing that and then something happens by the kill. As I'm swinging around, I press the button so the camera is instantly back at the range of the kill because the trick, especially with mirrorless cameras, the trick with their AF systems is they do much better when the subject that you want to photograph is already more or less in focus. It makes it much easier for the camera to find that subject, get the subject, especially if you're using subject detection, and not get caught up on grass or backgrounds or things like that. So this gives you a big advantage there. So that's the first scenario. The second scenario where I use this a lot, and probably I even use this more than the first scenario is number two here, and that is when I'm photographing something at very close range. Mirrorless cameras in general will sometimes start going towards the background if they can't find your subject in the foreground. And it's very, very common. And if you're dealing with a quick little subject like a small bird, a hummingbird, maybe a small mammal like a chipmunk or a mouse or something, if you're in that situation, that little animal's moving around. He's kind of hard to stay on as it is. It's very easy for focus to accidentally slip towards the background and it can cost you shots. My solution is to focus at the distance of that subject, preferably maybe even a little in front of that subject towards me. And then I'm gonna press that lens FN button and lock in that focus distance. And then the next time the lens starts pushing towards the background, focus starts going towards the background, I just press the lens FN2 button and it comes back to where my subject is and my success rate goes way up. It's much, much less frustrating. It's very, very quick to use. And if you haven't tried that technique, you definitely should. It's very worthwhile. So that actually does it though for our menu setup. I hope this has been helpful. So there you have it. That's my autofocus menu setup and kind of how I use the buttons with autofocus in the camera. And again, though, I want to emphasize that you should pick what works best for you, not just parrot the stuff that I'm doing in your menus. Make sure that everything that you're setting in your camera makes sense for the way you work in the field because we all are different. So, you know, again, don't take any of this as like the only way to do it. There's lots of different choices out there and hopefully this gives you a good start. And once again, I do want to remind you, I have that setup guide for the Z8 and the Z9, and that covers everything we talked about in this video even more thoroughly with more examples. And on top of it, again, especially if you're interested in autofocus, it covers all the AF area modes, what they do, when to use them, when not to use them, all that important stuff, as well as how to use subject detection and get the most out of it. There's pages and pages and pages that are critical for any Z8 or Z9 user to know. In addition, of course, we cover a bunch of other stuff. There are dozens and dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of other items in there. So make sure you check out that book. I think you'll really like it. And honestly, at this point, I think I've taken up enough of your time. Thanks for hanging with me throughout this video, and have a great day.